from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Let me introduce tonight's presenter, presenters, and then I'll mute myself so they can talk. So we have Christy Feinfield, a reference librarian in the Library of Congress Prints and Photographs Division, specializing in visual materials relating to the concept of place. Christy has a Bachelor's of Architecture from Virginia Tech and an MSLS from the Catholic University of America. She writes for the library's Picture This blog and also helps moderate the library's Flickr account. Her recent video series with, series with historian Sam Waters, Every Photo is a Story, discusses strategies for researching photographs. Joining Christy is Tom Bober. Tom serves as the Library of Congress 2015 and 16 Teacher in Residence for Audiovisual Materials, a librarian at RM Captain Elementary School in Clayton, Missouri. Tom has used a variety of primary sources on historical and scientific topics from the Library of Congress to help students construct knowledge. Tom and Christy, take it away. Thank you, Cheryl. As you've just heard, my name is Christy Feinfield, and I'm a reference librarian in the Prints and Photographs Division, or PNP, at the Library of Congress. Being a reference librarian in PNP means my job focuses on connecting researchers and visual materials. I do that work in person in the Prints and Photographs reading room, over the phone, and through our Ask a Librarian email service. And today, Tom and I will be connecting you with visual materials with a focus on how to explore photos and the stories around them, as well as make them a part of your classroom experience. The Prints and Photographs Division holds the National Picture Collection for the United States. While international in scope, the collections are particularly rich in materials either produced in the U.S. or documenting the history, lives, interests, and achievements of the American people. The 15.6 million collections images in the collection include photographs by far the most common format, fine and popular prints and drawings, posters, and architectural and engineering drawings. Every year, on average, the collections grow by about 300,000 items, and we digitize about 50,000 images to add to our online catalog. More than 1.2 million images are available online through the Library of Congress website and we'll start by talking about how you can find those images. Be aware that guidance and help with your questions is available on site at the Library of Congress in the Prints and Photographs Reading Room and from off site through the Ask a Librarian service. On the Library of Congress website, there are many places to find visuals. We will include a few slides at the end of our presentation today to help you find all of the online sources for images through the Library of Congress. While the bulk of the images at the library are found in the Prints and Photographs Division, with the Library of Congress search system, you can find visual materials from throughout the library's divisions on our website. There are search tips specific to each catalog and search system available through the Library of Congress, but today I'm going to offer a few quick tips on how to achieve better results when looking for images. The first primary tip is think visually. Use words that describe what you hope to see in an image. For example, instead of trying World War II home front as your search, try Victory Garden, Woman Factory, Scrap Aluminum. Use fewer words. Many records in our catalogs are transcriptions of a caption or caption card. So for instance, an individual's first name may not be included or fully spelled out. Be sure to check the spelling and spacing of your search words. Are there alternate spellings? Could two words have been combined into one or vice versa in image captions? For example, streetcar versus street car. Have you used abbreviations that can be spelled out? This is especially important when searching for um, addresses, avenue versus A-V-E or street versus F-T. Read descriptions of individual collections to zero in on those relevant collections and browse the items within collections to see how images are described and for ideas of search terms to try. While all types of visuals can be useful in teaching, today I'm going to talk primarily about photographs. Recently I worked with architectural and landscape historian Sam Waters 
to create a five-part video series entitled Every Photo is a Story. In this series, one of our goals was to both share the stories captured in photos, as well as offer tips and tools for viewers to use when studying photographs and learning directly from those images. The collection featured in the video series contains 1,100 largely hand-colored lantern slides of gardens created by photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston. The photos were created between the 1910s and the 1930s. To accompany the videos, I also created try-it-yourself exercises, which allow you to apply some of the tips suggested in the videos to other photographs and collections in the Prints and Photographs Division. I hope you'll explore the videos and the exercises for more hands-on practice. Today, I'll walk us through the five sections of the video and how they can offer a structure to guide you in getting more from a photo than just a good illustration. Part 1, Start to Read a Photograph, suggests questions to the viewer and potential researcher, starting from perhaps the most patently obvious and then digging a little deeper. The top tips suggest looking closely at the image, front and back. We suggest you ask questions and make no assumptions about an image or its description, title, or caption. Describe what you see, look for related photos to put the image in context, and finally, ask how the photographer is shaping the scene. In this part, we introduce viewers to the idea that photographs are not necessarily a mechanical recording of fact and should be studied with that in mind. In the time provided, we'll only be able to touch on a few of the tips suggested in each part, but I hope to give a hint at what can be learned about a photograph with some exploration. Let's start with a brief exercise based on the tips for part one, start to read a photograph. Feel free to click on the link below the image to view a larger version of the photo. I've selected a photograph from the Prints and Photographs Division's collections. This photo is also featured in one of the try-it-yourself exercises available on the Every Photo is a Story website. Take a moment to look closely at this photograph. Do you see details that might offer clues to what is going on here? What stands out to you as unusual? What observations can you make about the people? I'll let you look for a moment before we continue. Okay, I'm going to now give some examples of what can be gathered by close looking at the high resolution file of, these, of this image. I always look for anything with text on it in an image. A street sign, an address, name of a business, etc. Finding text within a photograph is a great way to find out concrete details. Let's look together at some of the details I was able to observe by zooming in on the digital image. Here we have the text of an oath of allegiance to the United States. It is also a renouncement of loyalty to a previous foreign country. Looking closely at the people in the classroom, at least two observations stand out. All of the people here have the appearance of being students by virtue of being seated at desks with books in front of them, but many look older than the average college student. Also, the people seated would appear to be of different ethnicities based on facial characteristics. Combined with the oath, this starts to suggest a reason they are in the room. Let's keep looking. More text can be found on the other chalkboard. This one has the English alphabet as well as an assignment to write sentences. Taken on its own, this would seem more appropriate to students in a grade school classroom. So is this, in fact, a classroom? The two women standing in the classroom, including this one in front of the assignment, could be teachers. They don't appear to have recently vacated a student desk. A really close look at the book in one of the men's hands reveals an image of the Statue of Liberty, a very strong symbol of America and one often associated with immigrants. At this point, I try to speculate what the photo is showing. Who are these people? Why are they in the classroom? Asking questions is the best way to elicit answers. It's also a good way to check your assumptions and see if you have evidence to back them. 
I can assume this is a classroom at first glance, but it's important to then find reasons to support that assumption. With your observations and speculations in hand, let's turn to the accompanying information in the online catalog. The catalog records which accompany images from the Prints and Photographs Division vary widely in the amount of detail and type of information provided. This is often a function of what level of cataloging was completed, as well as what the source for the descriptions was, a caption card file, the information found on the object itself, a title devised by a visual materials cataloger. Different items and collections come with different amounts of information, so you have to work with what is provided. In this case, we are provided a very simple title of Americanization class. If you go to the notes area of the catalog description, you will, you will see that the title comes from, quote, unverified data provided by the National Photo Company on the negative or negative sleeve. This tells you a few things. The information, including the title, have not been checked by a staff person, and that the words used came directly from the time the photograph was taken and from the source of the photo. What does the word Americanization mean here? This is when it's helpful to compare your observations and conclusions gathered by looking closely with what is provided in written form with the photo. How well did they match up? What were the differences? When you know the data is unverified, it can pay to be skeptical and see if you can find visual evidence to support or dispute the provided title or caption. Another tip we offer in part one of the webcast is to search for related photos in the same collection as well as outside that specific collection. I can start this search by typing the title I was given into a search blank. A search for Americanization class in the same collection offers a close variant to the photo we started with. Studying this image offers additional insight and likely stimulates more questions. Explore other photos in the collection. What kind of photos are they? What kinds of topics do they cover? Searching elsewhere in the collection can also offer different perspectives on the photograph and place it within a new context. I'm going to turn it over to Tom for a few slides now. As you're preparing to use images with students, you'll want to think about how students will access the image files. They may be looking at the image on a projector screen or interactive whiteboard. They may be looking at the image on their own device or on a desktop, laptop, or tablet in a small group. They may be looking at a printout of the image. A lot of this will have to do with the technology that's available to you and your students. And some of this may be based on the level of detail you want your students to see. Printing the image will not allow, usually allow you to see some of the details that Christy just pointed out in the photo we were looking at. And in that case, you'll want to view the file digitally. And you'll want to download the highest resolution TIFF file if you can. Just like any large file, if you have the opportunity, download these files ahead of time. It can save you from any internet hiccups or long download times that you can experience in your school. If the image doesn't contain fine details, the largest JPEG file could be acceptable for viewing on a screen. When printing, I usually do a test print to make sure that I'm able to see the level of detail and sharpness that will allow my students to analyze the image. Speaking of analyzing, the Library of Congress has a teachers page at loc.gov teachers that has a primary source analysis tool for students and teacher question prompts to help with image analysis. Here, I'm on the Library of Congress teachers page. On the left, I clicked on using primary sources. Then I clicked on teachers, guide, and analysis tool. The primary source analysis tool can be filled out and printed online, or there is a link to a PDF version. I'll show you that in a, an example of that in just a moment. The teacher's guide is a PDF. Here's the teacher's guide. You'll notice that it's organized in four categories. Observe, reflect, question, and at the bottom, further investigation. These are the steps that we want students to go through when analyzing an image. Observations are going to be specific things that can be seen in the photo. So you may ask, what did you notice first? Or what is the physical setting? Making observations are what we've done in the first step of Christie's analysis of, this photo, of the photo from earlier. Reflections ask students to infer based on their observations as well as their own understanding of the world. So I might ask, 
what's happening in the image. They will bring in their observations of the photo and what they know about class, classrooms to make it reflections in their analysis. And questions are just that, but can sometimes be diffi a difficult part of analysis for students. What does this photo make you wonder about? What is a, still a mystery to you? What do you want to know more about? Those questions that students ask can help guide next steps in their thinking. At the bottom are suggestions for how students can show their learning from their photo analysis. This is a mock-up of the primary source analysis tool that students may use. You'll notice it has the same categories as the teacher's guide. I want to point out a few things that I encourage when my students are analyzing. First, I don't ask them to write in incomplete sen sentences. Some do naturally, others like to list things, especially when making observations. Second, you might notice the arrows drawn between the categories. I sometimes ask my students to do this to help them explain their thinking. Students' reflections and questions should naturally connect to one or more things they saw in the image. So for example, if a student in the reflection writes that they think this is a classroom, but in their observations has nothing written that relates to a classroom, they haven't really made their thinking visible. That of course doesn't mean that they aren't thinking about it, but making those thoughts visible through the primary source analysis tool can help them when they're sharing their ideas or taking that analysis into a larger aspect of their learning. Also, and you can't see it through this example, but a student analyzing an image using this tool is not a linear, lin linear process. They don't fill out all of their observations and then all of their reflections and then all of their questions. I'm expecting them to jump around. Many of them start with an observation or two. It's a natural starting point, but then they'll move between the three columns from there. And finally, my recommendation, if you have students who have never read an image before, is to model this with them as a whole group, much like Christy did, started to do with the previous uh, image. No matter how old they are, have them do another in pairs or small groups. You'll be surprised how that collaboration can help students see things or think about things that they would not on their own. With that base knowledge of the tools students and teachers have at their disposal, let's dive deeper into the analysis of our image with Christy. Thank you, Tom. Those are all great points, and those tools must come in extremely handy in a classroom. Um, let's move on to part two. In part two, get to know the photographer. We look to the person behind the camera and ask viewers to apply basic research skills, much as one might with any research topic. The researcher should consult secondary reference sources, both printed and online, track down primary sources such as magazine and newspaper articles from the photographer's lifetime, and if you're lucky, locate the papers of the photographer. Use these sources to establish a chronology of key dates and places in the photographer's life. As with title and caption information, the information available about the photographer can vary widely and under, understanding that is key to working with archival collections. In some cases, we not only know the photographer, but know a great deal about the photographer's life, influences, and career. In other cases, we know the photographer's name, but little about them. And as in this case, we sometimes do not know the name of the photographer at all. As you can see, there is no creator listed in our catalog record. When we do not know the photographer, and even when we do, it's good to turn to the collection which the photo is part of to learn more. That information is provided in the record itself, as well as at the top right in the Part Of box. Clicking the link there takes you to the home page of the collection. On this home page for the collection, there will always be an About This Collection entry, as well as sometimes articles and essays about the collection. In many cases, these include biographical information, the scope of the collection, explanations of how the collection was acquired, cataloged, digitized, and organized. Learning this information places the single photograph into a telling context. In part three, consider how the photos were made. We shift our attention from the photographer to the object. In the case of the video series, the photo in a colored lantern slide. Consider the original photograph. What size is it? What format? What camera was used to create it? How does this influence your understanding of the image? 
take into consideration what happens after the shutter snaps, what changes or manipulations may have been made. Consider the photographer's time involved in making the image. Consider the client, the purpose of the photo, the audience for which it was intended. Today we're going to focus on how thinking about the audience for a photograph affects how we view and understand it. Let's return to the information about the National Photo Company collection. This photo of an Americanization class was taken by a photographer working for the National Photo Company. But who was the target audience for the photo? Why was this photo taken? There are a few places this information can be gleaned for the collection as a whole. One is the About This Collection and the supporting documents I mentioned in Part 2. The other is what is known as a guide record. These can be found in the Library of Congress online catalog for collections from the Prints and Photographs Division. They are compact summaries of creator, date, subject, and historical information for an entire collection. You can see part of what such a record looks like at the right of the slide. By reading over the About This Collection and the Guide Record for the National Photo Company, I find information about different audiences for the photographs. According to these two documents, photographers for the NPCC undertook photographic assignments for local businesses and government agencies, and they also took photos to sell to newspapers, news distributors, and other photo agencies. We don't know at this time why this photograph was taken or for what purpose. How do you think the audience for the photo would affect how it was framed? What would be included or left out? The photographer has control over when and how he or she takes the photo. For example, a photographer working for a news agency might be thinking about the market for this photo, while a photographer working for a government agency sponsoring this class might want to show the class in the best possible light. Can you guess the audience just by looking at the photograph? What evidence supports your speculation? Part 4 takes a broader view by suggesting we explore the photographer's era. Like any art form, photographs are not created in a vacuum. We discuss the time period during which the work was made. In the case of the videos, Johnston's work was taking place during the heart of the Progressive Era and the City Beautiful movement, and that certainly influenced her choices and the work she received. Aesthetic preferences, art movements, landscape design, composition, all of these had an impact on the work Johnston did, as well as how it was received. One way to learn about the photographer's era is to turn to published sources like newspapers and magazines of the time period. Chronicling America on the Library of Congress website offers free access to digitized newspapers dating from 1836 to 1922. To try and answer my own question about audience for the photograph, as well as what the term Americanization meant at the time of the photo, I tried a simple search for the phrase Americanization class and was lucky enough to get the page on the right as my first result. At lower right, I find the exact photograph we've been talking about. Let's look a little closer. As you can see at lower right, this search gave me several new pieces of information. A more complete caption, where the photo was taken, what nationalities the students represent, confirmation that the women standing are the teachers and their names. We also now have more information about the date as this photo was featured in the August 8, 1920 edition of the Sunday Star. I also know that at least one audience for this photograph was this newspaper in Washington, D.C. By reading the rest of the page to see what other photos were featured in this section, as well as pursuing the other, other results for my search in Chronically in America, I can also start to glean more information about this photo and the time period it belongs to. I can find more hints about the term Americanization as well. The fifth and final part is where we pull the threads together to interpret the stories we've discovered. In the top tips for this section, we reinforce the themes of each part. We encouraged viewers to look closely at the photographs, to study who took the picture, to search for related written information, and to ask lots of questions, and to ask for help. As always, we encourage you to seek out reference librarians like myself, 
archivists, historians, and other experts. So keeping all that in mind, what is the story of this photograph? We know a bit more about the circumstances of the photo now. We have the who, what, when, where, and how of the image. This is a good point to think about the photo itself, and then to step outside the photo and ask how this photo fits into the bigger story of America in 1920. And I'm going to turn things over to Tom, and he'll tell you how to bring these strategies to the classroom. Thanks, Christy. The final step that Christy asked us to do here, and if I can, I'm going to go back to these questions. They are really the further investigations that we would ask students to do. What's the story of this photograph? How does this story fit into, this, fit into the story of America in the 1920s? How does a student then share what he or she knows? How do they fit it into the larger context of a time period or an event or a biography? This is truly where analysis of images fits into student thinking and learning. A final few things to think about when including images into student learning. How do you want students to access the image? Are they given to the students by the teacher? Are the students going to be searching for images on their own? And what kind of time is that going to take and skill on their part? Regarding bibliographic information, do you want students to have it all at once? When should they have it? Sometimes, like in our example today, you want them to thinking about the photo and asking questions before they have any of the bibliographic information that gives some of those answers, but may lead to other questions and searches like we saw with our image today. Don't forget about the creator's voice. It's very easy to focus so much on what the camera caught that we forget that the person behind it was taking that photo for a reason, and that reason reveals some of the story that he or she is trying to tell. Be thinking before your students even ask for it about other sources that can be brought in to complement the image, both primary sources and secondary sources. And this happens for one of two reasons. Either the other resource is informing the students about the photo, or the photo is informing the students about the other resource. So thinking about how all of those resources fit together and playing with those ideas as a teacher can really lead to deep layered learning on students' parts. And finally, from personal experience, this may look messy the first time. Students may not get to where you want them to be in their thinking. While extremely beneficial, it's not always intuitive for students to learn in this way, and it wasn't intuitive for me to teach in this way. I had to try it reflect on the steps, what I said, the results, make changes and try it again. And that, I know that sounds like a lot of work. And if the amazing student thinking didn't happen, the more I did this, I wouldn't be talking to you about it today. I want to share a few additional resources with our last three slides. And I'm not going to go deeply into all of these, but just point a few things out quickly. These are all additional related resources for you to explore. And Christy and my idea was to give you things that you could go back to later and look at more closely. They're all linked and they'll be available in the archive of this presentation. I'll mention on this page in particular the Ask a Prince and Photograph Librarian. It is an incredible resource. When you feel like you are getting stuck and you don't know where else to go, this is a great place where you can go and ask your question of an actual individual and they'll get back with you. It's wonderful and I've used it and had great results from it. Here are several links that start to make the million plus images av available through the Library of Congress much more manageable. I won't point everything out to you, but I will point out the interesting things I'm sorry, it won't point everything out to you, but it will point to interesting things that you or a colleague may be able to use in your classroom. I'm a big fan of the Picture This blog. I subscribe to it, so I just receive emails anytime there are new posts. And even if it isn't an image that I may be interested in right away, often I tuck it back and I found myself going back to that blog time and time again to pull something for myself or a colleague. And these are teacher resources from the Library of Congress. 
The teacher page that I mentioned earlier is here, as well as the blog, which not only points to resources, but to teaching strategies for using those resources. I think it's amazing. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Cheryl for some final information. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Christy. Um, and thanks to all the participants for the lively discussion. And we have quite a few questions waiting for you. Um, so the first question, I think, is probably for Tom, although, Christy, you might have ideas, too. Let's let Tom start. The question is, can you give some tips for using photograph analysis with younger students? Absolutely. So I am in an elementary school before I was here with the library for this school year. And we did quite a bit of analysis as early as kindergarten. So five years, six years old. And I would say the first thing is that if you can, actually having that print copy of the image is really beneficial. They are tactile. They want to touch it. They want to point to it. And they want to kind of get their hands on it. If they can have a pencil or a crayon and circle mark on the image, that is wonderful. Now, if you work with the little ones, you know they're going to be talking anyway, so you might as well make it as collaborative as possible. Give them a couple of minutes to talk to a partner, then bring it back and talk with the whole group. Uh, you're going to really start to tease out ideas and get this wonderful collective thinking going on when you have all of, that, uh, all of those ideas thrown out together. And have an idea of what you think where you think, excuse me, students are going to go, but also be open for different ideas. Uh, I know that when we work with older students or when we do this with adults, we have a really strong idea of where they're going to go because we are adults or we're closer in age. But I have always find myself surprised what students find important. And on that note, sometimes I also, also really target those observations with questions like, what do you think is important in this image? Or what do you think is interesting in this image? And I might need to ask them follow-up questions to really start to understand their thinking because they may not be able to initially verbalize it. So those are a few ideas for working with uh, images with younger students. Tom, a follow-up question to that is, what has surprised you in working with students on using pictures? I'd say simply that. I try to think through every direction that they are going to go with their observations, their reflections, and their questions. And inevitably, even when I've done a, an, an analysis with a group of five, six, seven-year-olds, um, and since I'm in the library, I'll do it with three classes, I can come back the next year and I can have a student bring back up something that not only did I not think of, but those 60, 70, 80 kids the year before didn't think of. And so it's just being open to all those directions. And I find myself having to really step back and make sure that I'm not guiding that image analysis too much, that I'm listening to what they're saying and then asking them clarifying questions to let them lead the analysis so I don't shut down that thinking. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kinds of items that excite you as teacher librarian or that your students have responded particularly well to? I think the key thing that I like to do is two things. First of all, bring in images that have other children in them. My students seem to react really well to those. They feel like they're in a place where they can speak uh, to that. It could be images at school, at home, on the street. It doesn't seem to matter. Uh, they react to images of children. And then the other thing, and this has to do with when you bring the image in um, to do the analysis, uh, bringing it in before. I've had less success bringing the, that in before students are have any exposure with their classroom teacher. More often, once they have a little bit of background with their classroom teacher, maybe not too much, but that's a great time to bring in a photo to start to look at that idea in a different way or in a deeper way because they'll have a little bit of a grounding and they'll feel like they can really contribute something to uh, that, that analysis. So Tom, go ahead and uh, 
There's another follow-up question for you. Um, do you ever use props related to what's in the photograph to make the experience more multi-sensory? I'm trying to think of an example where I have done that. And to be completely honest with you, I haven't. I think probably the closest we've done is we've had some images of uh, school settings that we've analyzed and we have walked around the school to clarify some things. Sometimes a group will, and th this is this is where things get interesting when students have disagreements. Uh, so how do you resolve that dis those disagreements? And the place where you can resolve disagreements are in the observations. You, you should be able to agree on the observations. You may, may not agree on the reflections, um, but you can agree on the observations. So when students are trying to bring in their own context um, and we can get quick access to that context, so we can get quick, ac quick access to those school settings, then take advantage of that. And so I think in that sense, those props, those uh, that may be related to the photograph would be a great way to bring in that context uh, and, and give them another way that they can bring in their own knowledge to then reflect on the photo. One point I was going to make is that the same photo can offer different levels of information for different audiences. So even though our Every Photo is a Story series is kind of geared towards older students or adults, it's possible to take the same photo and change the kind of questions you're asking. Um, if you take, for an example, we have photographs of Civil War soldiers. So if you show some a, a young student a photograph of an African-American soldier, it will definitely give them questions about what was the role of African-Americans in the Civil War. They may or may not know that. Um, they can look at the, the person and, and observe how old they are. You know, does that person look older than you? things like that, and then you can take that same photo to a different level with different uh, interest groups. So some people are studying the uniforms, some people are determining what states they fought for, what state, what kind of soldier they are. Um, so it's just a point to make that uh, just because you see a photograph used for a certain age group, it's possible that you can, can look at it a different, from a different angle and offer it to a younger, a younger audience as well. Excellent points, Christy, and, and you've generated some additional conversation. Um, we have time for just a couple more questions, but before we take those, let me just point out some ending housekeeping in case people need to duck out. Um, that we would appreciate your feedback on this session. We have a three-question survey. Um, so it'd be great if you could click through that. It's on the slide, and I also pasted it into the chat box. Um, for completing this session, you can earn a certificate. You have earned a certificate for one instructional hour, and you'll receive an email within five business days with instructions on how to access that. So a uh, question for Christy. Christy, okay. what are the most interesting kinds of questions that you've fielded, or if you have a single one that stands out, um, a little insight into your life as a reference librarian. What gets you excited? Uh, you know, one of the things that's exciting for me is that I, I get a different kind of question every day. There are certainly recurring questions. Um, we have people, since we're in DC, people often come in and ask for help finding historic photos of the place they live or um, an area they know in DC. And that's always fun, because it is definitely a treasure hunt through our collections to find that exact location um, at the time period they're interested in. But something I find interesting is when a user um, comes to me and wants to use visual materials in a way I hadn't thought of before. Um, I had a researcher come in who was actually looking at some of our 18th century drawings for a modern purpose. And typically, folks who are looking at those older drawings, it's for an academic reason. Um, and this gentleman was actually part of an archaeological dig. And they were trying to find um, artifacts from the French and Indian War, if I remember correctly. And he was able to use drawings done in 1760 to actually pinpoint an area that he was going to go back and, and look into and try to find a structure of a fort from that time period. So it was a use for that particular drawing that had not occurred to me before. 
Um, and I try to, f you know, a lot of the questions that come to mind um, I feature in our picture of this blog, um, which is a fun way for me to explore them or share the kind of discoveries I make day by day. And I wanted to go back to uh, quickly to an earlier mention of students who love mysteries. And uh, one thing I would point out that if you go back to the picture of this blog, as well as the Flickr account for the Library of Congress, you'll see that recently we've actually been posting uh, what we call our mystery photos, where we have collections for which uh, there are no captions on the photos. And we are selecting out groups of them, ones that we think are solvable mysteries. And we're posting them on our Flickr account and asking people to try to figure it out. Um, so we don't actually know the answer in many cases. So it is a true challenge for people. And uh, we do get a really good response for that. And I think it would be an interesting uh, lesson for perhaps older students. Some of them are tricky. But there are certainly clues there that would appeal to many age groups. Um, so that's something that we try to do, engage people with our photos in different ways. Thanks, Christy. And, and there were a number of comments earlier in your presentation in the chat about the value of engaging students in mysteries. And what's more exciting than a real mystery that even the experts don't know? Um, students so infrequently get a chance to explore that, to experience that. Um, I'm going to wrap this up. I think we've answered all the questions that came in. Again, thanks to Tom and Christy for a, a rich and lively conversation. And thanks to everybody who participated. This works because you come and make it work. So um, again, it would help us if you would take this very short survey. The link is on the slide. Um, <clears throat> and ah, thank you, Dana. Dana Bell has posted in the exact link to the blog post that I was reaching for. Um, so thanks for that. This will be, um, I'll be closing this off in about 30 seconds. So grab that survey link. And thanks so much. I'm going to stop the recording now. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.